Welcome to Hashing Out the Law. I'm your host, R.S. Shashemi. We're in season four, and my guest today is Officer Douglas Griffith. Officer Griffith is from Houston, and he started his law enforcement career with the Houston Police Department in 1991. He's currently an active officer and also serves as the president of the Houston Police Officers Union. As you know, there's been a rise in crime all across the nation. Some people have blamed this rise in the laws that have taken into effect in various states. I wanted to have Officer Griffith on so we could discuss a police officer's point of view on whether these new laws are in fact the cause of rise in crime. I hope you enjoy. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another season of Hashing Out the Law. I'm very excited. We're on season four. And last episode, I had on uh, a law enforcement from Missouri. Today, I have with me Officer Doug Griffith from Houston Police Department. Officer Griffith is actually an active police officer. He's also the president of the Houston Police Officers Union. Did I say that right, Officer? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being on, Officer. Now, um, I briefly gave a little background about who you are, but please introduce yourself. Let the guests know um, you've been in law enforcement for a long time, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I come on in 1990 with the Houston Police Department, uh, did a couple of years of patrol. I was then pulled to a brand new unit they developed here, which was the Gang Task Force Unit. I did that for approximately 25 years uh, and then was elected to the vice president of the union. And now I'm uh, the president of the union. So I've had a long career with uh, chasing bad guys in, in the gang unit and had a lot of fun doing it. Now, that, that's very intriguing to me. So as you know, um, we're based in Los Angeles and L.A. is the gang capital of the world. Um, and this is where, you know, we, we it's sort of like um, we're proud of it, but <laughs> we're not. We're, we're the <laughs> we're the originators of the street gangs. And, you know, the street gangs that spread across the country. Um, I don't know much about Houston and, and the gangs in Houston. So I'm going to diverge from our main topic and, and ask you a little bit. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, the gangs in Houston and, and what it's like? And is it as bad as other cities in the country or other states? It, how, how big is the gang culture there? Um, you know, it started off, like I said, in the, in the uh, late 80s. When crack hit the scene, it, it, we had a few gangs here and there, but that seemed to propel them up a little higher because it was all about um, whose turf you were selling narcotics on. And that's the way it kind of developed here in Houston. Uh, the difference here from like L.A., L.A., there's a very hard line between, you know, the different sets of gangs, Crips, Bloods, Bounty Hunters, so forth. Here, it was not unusual to have a, a neighborhood gang and there'd be Crips and Bloods in that same group, which is just weird when you start looking at how it is in other, other cities. But for them, it was about making money. And if you could work with a Blood to make money, a Crip was good with that. Now, if they got crossways, we had Crip and Blood battles. We had Bounty Hunter battles. We had, you know, the little street cliques. Uh, they would battle back and forth. Uh, right now, we got a, a group here that's pretty violent called um, uh, Young uh, Young Scott Block, and uh, they're they're terrorizing half the city, and we were having to put try to put boots on the ground to put a stop to some of that. But overall, we've always had a gang problem here since I've been on, but it's nowhere near you're going to see in in California. I see. We could do a whole episode on that. It, it's fascinating oh. to me, but um. The reason I brought you on is, is to talk about um, some of the criminal justice uh, reforms that have happened, not just in Texas, but all across the country, such as uh, the no cash bail reform. Uh, California raised their um, threshold for petty theft, which uh, a lot of people say resulted in a, in a high crime rate. But crime has, has been on the rise nationwide. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about an incident that occurred. Um, I think it was a week ago or a couple of weeks ago, um, and it was in the New York City subway system. 
Um, there was a 57 year old woman who was uh, attacked by a man who speared his own feces on her, like on her face, shoulders, because she wouldn't talk to him. Um, and then he was arrested. He was um, his name is Frank Abroqua. I, I believe I, I, I might have pronounced it wrong, but that's what it is. And then when he went, he went in front of a judge, um, he cursed out the judge. Um, and then the judge had to let him go because of the laws in New York. Uh, the prosecutors brought him back in, charged him with another crime, which was a hate crime. Um, but under the law, the judge still had to let him go. Turns out he's been arrested 44 times on a variety of charges. Um, now, I might have left some facts out, but I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that, that case, correct? Yes. Yeah, I've, I've heard about that case. And it's just abhorrent to think that somebody can just be standing there waiting for a subway train and someone assault them like that. It's, it's disgusting. And the fact that the judge released them, you know, with uh, on their personal recognizance after the way, even the way they acted in court, uh, I would hope we'd have a better system in place to deal with someone like that. But apparently we don't right now, especially in New York. Now, um, I know that California tried to to pass the same kind of law, no cash bail. Uh, it went to the it went. Uh, uh, actually, they, they they tried to pass it, implement it, but then it, it, people got a ballot signatures. It went on the ballot and it got shot down. But then there was some talk of reviving it. So California uh, didn't go the way in New York. But I've I've had other people on. Uh, in New York, and I believe New Jersey, some of these, is Texas no cash bail, or is, does Texas still have a cash bail system in? Our, well, at least in Harris County, the, uh, <clears throat> the they entered into an agreement after a lawsuit was filed for, regarding cash bail. And we're all in agreement for misdemeanor offenses. You shouldn't have to stay in jail uh, just because you can't afford to to bail yourself out of jail. I, I get that 110%. No problem. <clears throat> Our problem is that we have now morphed that into a system in which felonies are getting no bail uh, or they are uh, $100 bail. And for a felony offense to receive a $100 bail, that's a problem because you there's no ramifications. You pay that you know, $100. You're out of jail. You go do exactly what you're doing before. Get caught again. We have people on multiple felony bonds on a regular basis here in Harris County. We have over 120 people on bond for murder. We have at least 16 on bond for capital murder, which means that you kill someone in the commission of a felony or you kill multiple people or you kill the police officer. That used to never happen. Never. Yet we have it happening here today in Harris County. So, Officer Griffith, um, I have two questions. But the first one is, uh, do you think that the no, no cash bail system um, overall is is one of the factors that goes to the rise in crime in America? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I know. No I, I know you mentioned that you believe that whoever has a misdemeanor should be allowed to 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 get out of and not stay there. Um, I agree with you, but let me ask you this. Um, so let's say you have one person who uh, is arrested for a misdemeanor, it's let out, and then continues to do the same thing. Now, every time they they commit a crime, it's a misdemeanor. Should they be let out every time while there's pending cases? Or do we put a limit on how many misdemeanors you get before you have to actually have a bail? Well, in Harris County, well, in the state of Texas, actually, we have a system in place. So if you're a repeat offender, after your third time, it goes up to a felony. And that's the way it, it needs to be. And then at the felony level, the problem is they want to give them a $100 bail. And again, if you're breaking into cars on a regular basis, you may hit 50, 60 cars a night, get whatever you're getting out of them. The one time you get caught, you go to jail, you get back out. Again, the first time or two, you know, that's that's one thing. But after your third time, you're proving that you're not going to change your your habits. You're going to go out there and do it again. Charge them with a felony offense 
and start holding them accountable, start holding them in jail. The problem is in, in the state of Texas in the last two years after bail reform, our criminal justice system is down by 20% in the prisons, 20%. There's plenty of room for these guys, but our jails, our Harris County jail is full. We can't get, we can't move them over because they're not wanting to have trials. We, our court system here is so jacked up right now. Some of them blame COVID. Others are just playing out liberal. We have a guy that's a socialist, self-admitted socialist, on his Facebook page. He's wearing a T-shirt that says defund the police, doesn't believe anybody should be in jail, and that's running your, one of your courts over there in Harris County. Well, if you, why, why do you have a court system if you don't believe they should be in jail? Judges have one job, and that's to protect the citizens of their county in which they serve. And they're failing at that here in Harris County. Luckily, we were very vocal and very active against several judges that were doing this. We had two judges, didn't have a trial for two years, not one trial in their courtroom. Luckily, they have been beat out in the primary. They're not even going to make it into the, the main election. So we feel very confident that we're going to have some change here in Harris County. And hopefully we'll get some judges in there that understand the job and are prepared to do that job. Let me ask you this. How can a judge not have a trial in his courtroom for two years? Was it because everything was just being dealt out or what was what was happening? His initial statement was COVID. We can't have people in the courtroom because of COVID. OK. I get that for a couple of months, but then it just continued. The only thing he would ever sign off on is agreements that were if the, the courts come in and, and made an agreement, let's say a D.A. decided hey, look, we're going to offer this guy six months probation and sign off on it. They would do those, but it was all done behind scenes, no courtroom. So if you're not having trials, then you've got guys out there on multiple bonds. Again, we've got over 25,000 people that have an open warrant in Harris County right now. 25,000 felony warrants out there. We get them, put them in jail. They're given a low bond and sent right back out because there's no room in the jail. That's just Harris County, correct? That's just Harris County. Is Harris County one of the biggest county in Texas? I'm not very familiar. It is? Yes, sir. Harris County is the largest county in the state of Texas. And we have uh, per capita, it'd be us, Austin, or Dallas would be second, Fort Worth, then Austin, San Antonio. I see. So out of those cities, they're all seeing the same thing. All the major cities here in Texas have that same issue. Um, again, it, it stemmed from a lawsuit that there was a gentleman's agreement that we're going to change it this way. The problem, again, when you have repeat violent offenders, I mean, we've got guys on four and five bonds for aggravated robbery because they keep letting them out, letting them out on low bonds. They're, they've proven they're not going to be a productive member of society. At some point, we got to hold them before they kill someone. Sadly, we have also... 160 people that were released on multiple felony bonds, not just one or two, multiple, that turned around and killed someone in the last two years. That's crazy. Now, let, let me ask you, let me ask you this. So give you a little fact pattern. California changed the law uh, before the threshold for a felony as opposed to a misdemeanor theft was $450. California changed it. Uh, it's now a little bit uh, 900 and change. So if you go to a store and you you steal anything uh, and it, the value is less than the threshold, which is 900 and change, you get charged with a misdemeanor, which then, you know, because of COVID and other reasons, they cite you out. You just get a citation and, and you go out. And people are saying, like, look, these people are are, are just getting cited out, knowing that they're not going to uh, be charged with a felony and they're going back and doing the same thing, making sure it's less than the threshold. And then recently, about a couple of months ago, we had these uh, uh, smash and grab robberies. I don't know if you saw it on the news where a whole bunch of people, like 20, 30 people um, had pre-planted. They would go into a store like, you know, fancy stores, break everything, start grabbing everything and walk out. And then the argument ensued that 
you know, this law needs to be rescinded. The threshold is, is too high now. Some people made an interesting uh, point, and they said that in Texas, the threshold is $2,500 or something like that. And Texas doesn't have the same problem. So it's not the threshold. Uh, my question is now, I don't know if that's true or not in Texas. Is the threshold higher in Texas? And do you guys have the same problem? And if you don't, why is that? No. Well, we have like what they call takeover crews. You'll see them come into like a Macy's and bust out the glass and take all the watches and, and run. But it's not like you have there in L.A. Uh, the it, the threshold is not twenty five hundred. I think that's uh, they're they're confusing that with other things. The Harris County we have a seven fifty threshold, but we're not seeing the same uh, type of incidents yet. Again, uh, understand we have people that we know were robbing people here in in Houston that traveled to L.A. and we're doing the same things there. So. It's, I think part of the issue is that it's kind of cyclical as you see it move across the nation. You've seen it in New York, you've seen it in LA, you've seen it in Chicago. We just haven't seen it here yet. I, I have a, a belief that it will at some point, you'll see them here doing the same thing. Now, all these reforms that we've had across the nation, each state has their own reforms, obviously, but all these reforms that we have, you know, um, and I'm going to uh, sidetrack for a second. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about the controversy with L.A. County and our D.A., our district attorney, George Gascon. Um, he used to be the district attorney up in San Francisco, and then he came down here. He won. Uh, and then all this controversy started about how he doesn't want to prosecute people and things like that. That's a whole different story. But he's part of that reform that that's going across the country. Uh, a lot of people are saying that there, these reforms are the reason for the rise in crime, but some other people are saying, no, that is not the reason. Uh, the reason for rise in crime has nothing to do with the reforms. It has to do with, uh, with economics, with class, and, and, and with uh, our social status and, and our social upbringings. Um, what is your opinion as far as these reforms? Do you think these reforms are responsible directly for the rise of crime or, or do you think they are in part responsible or not responsible at all? I think they're to a great deal. They are responsible and, and I'll explain it. Um, I come from a very poor neighborhood myself. I understand what it's like to be poor, you know, living in a house with no, no AC, you know, gas heat, stuff like that. I get it, but that doesn't mean you have to continue your life that way. You work hard, you get out of those situations and move forward. So, yes, do we have areas that are economically depressed that have a tendency to, I guess, push you to a higher level of criminal activity? Yes, I understand that. Poor neighborhoods are always more crime ridden than nicer neighborhoods. We get that. But at the end of the day, you if you're not holding people accountable for their actions, then what's going to happen? They're going to continue to push that envelope. They're going to do uh, heavier crimes, more violent crimes. You've got to start learning to hold people accountable. And if we're refusing to do that as a society, just like here, like your DA there, that refuses to take certain charges. Once you start making your own rules, that's where it becomes a problem. As a society, we have determined and we have set laws in place that we believe are against the social norms of our society. And once we start go, venturing away from that for an individual person's beliefs or needs, and it's outside the realm of the rest of the community, that's where we come to have start having issues. If he's not going to prosecute these particular crimes because he doesn't believe in them, well, then he needs to go. When he gets somebody in there, it's going to follow the rule of law. The reason we have these laws is because we voted on them. We vote for the people going up there and making these laws. We request these laws. Those laws are now enacted in place. We have to enforce them. If not, then what's the point? This is going to be complete anarchy at the end of the day if we don't start holding people accountable. And it starts with our courts and it starts with our DAs. So let me ask you this question, playing devil, devil's advocate. You said that people voted for these laws. 
But then the, the counter argument could be that the people also voted for this DA. Um, and I'm not saying you're wrong or right or whatever, but I'm just saying that's an argument. Um, so my, my ultimate question is, how do we fix it? How do we fix where we are now? Is this something that just happens every 10 years, crime goes on the rise and it comes back down? Or is this something that, that's permanent? How do we fix it? What, what, is, what is the solution um, in your opinion? Well, again, I've been in law enforcement for 31 years. I've seen that pendulum swing back and forth over time. This is going to be another one of the situations where people are going to get tired of, of being scared when they leave their home. They're going to be tired of being victimized. And, you know, everybody was in for the social justice and, and let's, fix, let's fix the issues of society and, and all that. I get that. But at some point, you have to realize that there's certain people out there, no matter how hard you try, they are not going to be productive members of our society. They are going to against, go against our social norms, and they are going to be violent. They're going to not care what other people think, and there's a place for them. That's why we built jails across this country to hold people that are not going to live by our social, what we believe socially should be the proper way to act. And we have to hold those people accountable. And until we put some teeth to that, we will continue to see that pendulum swing that direction off to the left. What I don't want to have is an overcorrection where people get so tired of it that they push it so far left that we're putting everybody in jail. We don't want that either. There's a happy medium in there. You can, if you have the proper, I guess, punishment with regard to these offenses, then people will not want to commit those crimes again. People don't want to spend their time in jail. So how do we fix that? Well, we got to start early. We got to start teaching. We got to raise our kids better. And that's just the way it is. Uh, you take corporal punishment out of schools and you tell people, oh, little Johnny needs to be in timeout. And instead of, uh, you know, this is going to sound horrible. I'm not saying anybody should beat their children, but sometimes a good spanking is what they need. That's what they deserve and what they, that, that teaches them, hey, do not do this because there's, there's consequences to your actions. Set them in time out in the corner. There's no difference in setting them in the county jail for, for three days to make them sit, put them in time out, let them back out to continue to do what they were doing. They know they go into time out, they'll be right back out. We've got to have some teeth to the, to the laws and to the punishment that they're going to have to receive should they violate our laws. And until we get that in place, nothing's going to change. I agree with what you said that I think we need to start early um, and, and teach, you know, raise kids better. Um, because I, I think there's a, there's a, in my opinion, there's a disconnect between reality and and the fantasy that the kids see and grow up with, it's a whole different issue. But um, the family nucleus, I believe, is, is what's more, most important thing. And if, if that family nucleus is, is there and fixed, then I think the end result of it would, would be something that we wouldn't have to worry about as much. I think that's where the problem rises. Um, but do you think that we've gone too far to ever come back, meaning we've, we, we try to be open-minded and we try to fix all these problems that we see and all these solutions that we have um, obviously aren't working, but do you think that we've gone so far that we, we can't come back to where we were? Like, you know, obviously we're never gonna, I don't think we're ever gonna have uh, um, uh, corporal punishment in schools Right. Um, I, I, you know, I, we've, we're never going to have that again. No, I know no, they had it back in the day in the 50s, 60s and everything. But do you think we've gone too far um, where we can't go back on some of the laws, you know, some of the, the, the prison sentences? Do you think that it's never going to happen again? No, I think there's a happy medium in there that we can sit down and have adult discussions about and, and work it out. So everybody, everybody wins. We understand that that. There's some people that make a mistake, get that. And they shouldn't be, you know, the rest of their life should be ruined because they made one mistake. Completely understand that. But if you continue to make those same mistakes over and over and over, you're not wanting to change. 
we have to find a way to correct the, the behavior. And again, it's, it's one of those where you, sh- you have to start early. And, and I'm not saying we've lost a generation, but if we just focused on the next generation coming up and we made sure all those kids had a chance, a solid education, a solid skill, uh, something that to, to address them getting out of the situations they're in and start bettering themselves early, then we can continue in this country and be just fine. But if we continue to just neglect the kids and, and just, oh, they'll be all right, they'll be all right, they'll be all right, they'll grow up and, and, and change their ways, nothing's going to change. We have a whole generation of, of kids out there that don't even know who their dad is. That's sad. I mean, it really, it does, it breaks my heart. Uh, I've got two sons and, and a stepson, and I love them. I love all three of them. They're, they're, they're great kids. I'll do anything in the world for them. But you also have to set that standard for them. And in that same manner, we have to have adults that are going to go be mentors that are going to get into these schools and show these kids how they should act. Instead of seeing uh, Johnny Dope on the corner with all his gold and things, man, that's who I'm looking up to. We got to have them look up to, to people in the community that garner respect. And once we start that process, then we'll get somewhere. I, I agree with your points. Uh, one thing you said that caught my attention is we need to sit down and have a, a adult conversation. Uh, I think at this point, I think a lot of people don't have that capability anymore. Um, as long as soon as you don't agree with me, then I the enemy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, which is wrong. I, I think uh, we don't have to agree to be civil to each other and talk, right. but that's a whole different whole different issue as well um i know you're a very busy man i don't want to take up all your time i really appreciate you coming on is there anything else you'd like to say officer before we we conclude this episode uh just i want to thank the community because i know that the the vast majority of people out there support law enforcement and we appreciate it uh we know there's a vocal group out there that no matter what we do they're not going to like us but the silent majority out there respects what we do. They let us know that. And I just want them to know that we appreciate that fact. Thank you, officer. It was a pleasure. You have a good day. Anything I can ever do for you, my friend, you let me know. Thank you. Take care.